Welcome to this heat transfer video lecture. We're going to continue introducing convection. In this lecture, we're going to talk about local versus average heat transfer coefficients and laminar and turbulent flow. So thus far, especially as we've been talking about conduction, we've treated convection very simplistically. We've assumed that you just have an H, which is uniform over the entire solid. And that actually isn't the case. If you watched the last video lecture, you saw that that boundary layer can grow over the um, as you go down the length of a solid. So naturally, your heat transfer coefficient may change because the, the physics and the fluid flow across your system are actually changing. So that brings us to this topic of the local heat transfer coefficient. So rather than having a solid with this uniform H all the way around, really what happens is you may have a local heat transfer coefficient here. Your heat transfer coefficient may be different here than here. Um, and so what we really have to do is integrate over the entire solid to get the total effect, the total flow of heat, or the average heat transfer coefficient. So if we wanted to express flux at any point in our solid, we could use the local heat transfer coefficient expressed as just H, like we've been using. But really, that may only apply to a small area as depicted here. It may only apply to a small differential area um, over the total solid. If we wanted to get the total flow of heat across the entire solid, then we would need to use this h bar, where h bar is the average heat transfer coefficient. So what we would need to do would be first to calculate h bar, or we could integrate all those little pieces of heat with the local heat transfer coefficient and see what the sum total of all that heat transfer might be over an entire solid. So if we did that, um, that would look something like this. We would integrate, we would do a surface integral over the entire solid and multiply that by the local flux. And um, doing that would give us the total flow of heat from the entire solid. So that would be equivalent to um, integrating this H, our local heat transfer coefficient, over, over the entire solid. And that's assuming that we have a constant surface temperature all over our entire solid. So if we did have that constant surface temperature, um, we could calculate H bar, which is the average heat transfer coefficient using this formula. So we would take, we would integrate the local heat transfer coefficient over the entire area and then divide that by the total area to give us our average. So if we were dealing with a heat transfer coefficient that only changed in one dimension, like if we had one dimensional flow over a flat plate, really the only dimension we really care about is this x direction, which and this would have a total length of L. So if we were just talking about that one direction, then we could integrate just over the length and we could get our average heat transfer coefficient by integrating our local heat transfer coefficient uh, multiplied by dx from the length 0 to L, and then divide that by L to get our average heat transfer coefficient. So this may be a little bit confusing now, but we're going to follow this up with examples, and you can start to see how to apply something like this. First, I want to introduce a thought question. So we talked about this growing boundary layer, and this is thinking just in terms of laminar flow. So thinking through this, where do you think the local rate of heat transfer will be the highest? So give yourself some time. You can hit pause if you want to stop and think about this some more. But where, in terms of x, will the heat transfer be highest? Will it be here at the leading edge or here where the boundary layer is the thickest? And it's useful to think of this in terms of laminar flow. So see, this is nice and um, layered flow, laminar flow, which means the mechanism for heat transfer is going to be mostly by that molecular motion, something very much like conduction. If you recall back to our discussion of thermal resistances, you remember that the conductive thermal resistance was L over K, which means that the higher the L, the greater the thermal resistance you would have. So in this particular case, the local rate of heat transfer is going to be highest where L is the lowest. There will be less of that material because it's largely going to be happening by this molecular motion, a conduction-like mechanism. So we'd expect the highest rate of heat transfer to be here, and the lowest, so let's just say the highest flux here, and here where the boundary layer is very thick, we would expect the 
lowest flux because it has this biggest layer to propagate through. That's thinking only in terms of heat transfer happening by a conduction-like mechanism. One thing that happens is that uh, as your fluid travels, this boundary layer can get so thick that you start to have reverse flow. So that's when turbulence happens. So at some point with this uh, transition region, after you've reached a critical distance down the plate, your boundary layer has grown so thick that you can actually get conduction happening. So you get this swirling flow with these eddies and that uh, turbulence tends to mix up the fluid a lot more. So after this certain critical region where we get to a certain Reynolds number, um, the flow starts to back propagate and it starts to circulate and mix and you get you transition from laminar flow here and once you get to this critical distance down the plate then you transition to turbulent flow. So now another thought question. For this different uh, velocity profile where will the local rate of heat transfer be the highest? So again I'll give you some more time to think. This is a trickier question because now we have this other advective portion. If you remember our last video lecture, convection is basically the combination of conduction, which is heat transfer by molecular motion, where the fluid is relatively stationary, um, or even a solid is stationary, and advection, where heat transfer has happened by the fluid physically moving from one place to another. So you take this high temperature fluid and move it from point A to point B. You've also transferred that energy from point A to point B. So with, uh, especially once you get turbulent flow, that advection piece starts to become more and more substantial. So the answer to this question is a little bit of a tricky one. So you're still gonna have a fairly high rate of heat transfer here, where the boundary layer is very thin. But you're also going to have a pretty high rate of heat transfer in the turbulent region because now you don't have only this conduction mechanism, now you have this advection mechanism where that circulating fluid is carrying energy with it. So that bulk fluid motion, that mixing tends to take heat. So for example, if we follow this guy, it's going to take heat from here and it's going to mix it all the way through here where some of that heat might get picked up here and then here. So just that bulk fluid motion, all that circulating flow helps to mix the fluid up a lot better. And mixing is a really good way to transfer heat very effectively. So uh, it's a trick, very tricky question. And if we were to plot our heat transfer coefficient as a function of distance down the plate, we might see a, a high rate or a high heat transfer coefficient here where our boundary layer is the thinnest but then in this transition region as we start to transition from laminar to turbulent we would see this really large increase in our convective heat transfer coefficient ultimately we're to we get up to this peak so right about this point where we transition to turbulent flow you get this combination of the boundary layer still being relatively thin but you also have this turbulent circulating motion that's going to have a tendency to make heat transfer happen really effectively so as you transition from laminar to turbulent you can see pretty dramatic changes in the rate of heat transfer as, as demonstrated by the value of the convective heat transfer coefficient. So that's something to keep in mind is generally turbulence helps heat transfer quite substantially. So if you want more heat transfer, you generally want your flow to be turbulent.